Hi there, and welcome back to Torment Tides of Numenera, my friends. We're back in our mind. This is the portal that lead us to our sire. These are the portals that lead us to other areas, and I mean, it would be nice to pick someone up, right? And uh, thankfully, we have the map that tells us we can go back to the oasis, to the village, to the Crefton Fathom. The sorrows fathom. In the end, we can go to the path of to the resonance chamber. Let's see if we can pick someone up. Let's join this thing. Never been there. Ooh. Tolmagur slavers. These are. Wow. Really strange slavers. What is going on there? Stop the clock. And rock. Watch her. She's stronger than she looks. Yes. What are these guys? Oh, and what is this? Dim sickly lights flicker underneath the surface of this massive corpus. There is buried underneath here is never getting out. And yeah? The one has created a makeshift lean to from pieces they found here. Probably they, these guys, right? And here, sharp lemon scent pervades the air here. Every few minutes, a whiff of decaying flesh gusts forth before the lemon scent returns. Oh, just great. Hmm. She's stronger than she looks. Is that Tolmagur? What are you slavers doing? Give up Tol. Hey there. The slaver Tolmagur is here, her arms flailing across her body. Oh, that was the one who captured Rin. Shades of her tide addicted compatriots flicker around her, substanceless spectres who radiate a burning ephemeral need. Her hands pass through them, and each time she looks as if she's going to vomit, her feet are buried in the ground. She cannot move. You feel the tides coil within you, perhaps as a response to the hungry ghosts that surround Tol. Cancels, I know these shades, I killed them, but accidentally, I'm not a killer. I'm not. Tol, is that you? What is happening to you? Tol stops batting the shades for a moment, looking at no. Through Rin, I thought I heard something, a bird. And she cries out as another shade flickers near her face. Those ghosts, says Rim, I know them. They were people addicted to what she did to them. Without me around to temper her powers, she'd kill them. She turns to you, we should help her if we can. It was terrible to me, I know, but she needed me as well. She shakes her head, I'm not condoning what she did, I'm just... I want to forgive her. Tolmagur cowers, covering her head from a fresh attack. She seems completely unaware that either of you are even there. All right, those shades aren't real. You can free yourself. Can convince her. I mean, if Ridden could convince her, that would be nice. Let's try. Tomago struggles and screams against the need of her erstwhile minions, but somehow your words penetrate the barrier of her fear. He opens her eyes and sees you. She reaches, reaches out a hand to you and a spark of energy flashes between your fingertips. With it, awareness comes to her eyes. Is that my little bird? Unable to speak, Rin only nods. The shades fade away, away from around her and she mouths silent gratitude. She rests her weary head on the floor of the labyrinth and sinks into the ground, leaving no trace behind. Whoa. It was uncanny. I'm on it. We had her into the... Oh, the Philithis is also there. Several small animals chitter somewhere beneath the detritus. I oh. suppose there's something alive here. And here. This pile of debris rises and falls almost imperceptibly in regular intervals, as if something were breathing underneath it. But certainly nothing could live under there. The bloom. These shifting, roiling infinities belie the reality of the mounds of junk. This is a place of memories, nothing more. 
Oh, the junk of our memories. Is, is that a metaphor or what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you remember these times, not so good times, and others you forget, maybe. As far as you can tell, this filthis looks exactly the same as the one you met before. Perhaps is the same. As you approach, its hidden body seems to draw a deep breath, but nothing emerges. No words, no noise, no exhalation at all. Its glass mask seems fixed upon you, but it just as easily could be sleeping within. The thing just stands there, as if indifferent, until suddenly it speaks how many modes of light spilled upon the ground before you moved the basin. You can feel no thoughts at all from within the robed figure. Ah, uh, honey? Phyllis's glass face shimmers with iridescence for several moments before it speaks again. Yes, the yawl calf gets sour milk from its mother's teeth. Those that seek sweeter suckling waste away but never weep. The yawl herder spills salt tears, but the earth thirsts without tasting. Its mask darkens, but its voice carries on with flat indifference. Did you drink the light? What? Did we drink a light? Um, yeah, I drank, I drank in the light. Philithis leans its bulk forward to you, toward you, ever so slightly. No, you will burn in the light. Ask. Wow, it's telling us to ask. What did the light mean? What do your questions mean? The thing's voice warbles, as if with an echo that precedes the sound itself. Eventually words come. When the question is known, the answer is but a conclusion. Um, can you help me? A long groan sounds from within the Philetus's heavy robes. The voice that follows seems high and piping by contrast. A debauchee, his other diversions exhausted, sought the clammy embrace of a Nichtemeron. The romance ended tastefully, as did the Libertine. What? At this point I'll take whatever help I can get, clammy or otherwise. The robes rise and fall, suggesting the movement of smaller things beneath. Then it answers. In her ivory tower, the lady hears howling from the observation cells. Notes are taken. Actions are not... Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about this place? Almost with a sigh, it answers everything. Ah, uh, what will you tell me about this place? Nothing. Oh. <sighs> so you won't help me? Let this silence is answer enough. Why are you here? How are you here? It just cocks its ferret head and answers without emotion. I've always been here. And what are you anyway? That is not the question. Then what is the question? Philetus's face shines pearlescent and its voice for what is his heavy relief. Now you understand. A moment later its robes seem to sweep inward and it is it disappears. Ah, oh, right. Meeting Philosophical creatures. What is the question? Ah, the question is the answer. All right. What is that? Is that a reptile? Wrapped around an aging stone pillar is a plated creature unlike every anything you've ever seen. It hisses at the air, but its eyes, rows of them like a spider's, are fixed on you, glittering. It's just a statue, but your body trembles to look at it. It wants something more than just flesh. There's a strong feeling of malevolent intelligence surrounding this statue that you can't explain. Even more worrying, however, is the sense of familiarity you get while looking at it. The creature doesn't fit any kind of classification in the ninth world, and it appears too intelligent to be one of the created Numenera. This thing is a visitant from some more distant world, or possibly another reality altogether. I try to remember we know about this creature. 95? We have, we've got it. Over 100%.
Several memories strike you all at once, not memories of your own past life, but those of your siblings. You see yourself prostrate before a creature exactly like the statue, but larger and more menacing. During tears, terrified, the creature stretches out a claw, and some invisible force crushes your chest, a flash. Light from the creature's many eyes sears through your retina into your brain. You fall on the floor, aware but unable to move. In another memory, you storm through a burning village in search of some artifact. The memory races forward, and you present that artifact to the creature. Another flash. You are kneeling before the creature. It speaks in your mind, rise, my servant. Today you are no longer cast off. You are Trek again, and you will henceforth speak in my name and carry out my will in this world. But Dracogen was a cast off too. The memories flee. You're left trembling. This thing is Dracogen, the real Dracogen, not the man. It uses mortals for its own inscrutable ends, even as mouthpieces, as it did with the Dracogen you met in the bloom. Several cast offs have crossed it over the centuries. The creature finds the immortality and greed of your siblings useful that this regard for mortal lives convenient. The statue was constructed from their memories. One of them even served as a dracogon long ago. We examine it again. Flashes of memory do not repeat, but you know, know now. This is a statue of the true dracogon. It is a creature not of the ninth world, which uses mortals for its own inscrutable ends. Move side to side and see if the spider-like eyes follow you. The eyes remain fixed at the space you were standing before. Perhaps you just happened to notice them. You were standing in the right slow and deliberate care. The eyes swivel in their stone sockets and fix on you again. Feel the surface of the statue. You reach out to touch the scaled surface. The statue doesn't move and you hear nothing beyond the sound of your breath and yet... You feel something watching you from beyond this place. A sudden heat bakes the palm of your hand. Something tells you touching this statue is a bad idea. But we want to know! Yeah. Your fingertip scrapes across one of the gleaming scales and you hear a slow angry hiss before clawed hands close over your head from behind and squeeze. The darkness closes and coils around you, crushing the air from your lungs. Shouted words from the beast strike your mind like misshapen burning meteors. You try to scream, but nothing escapes, nothing. You awaken by inches, every joint aching. Something lies heavy and cold in your hand. At first, you take the gem lying there for one of the statue's eyes, and then you notice that the serpent is still as whole and untouched as before. That from us, or what? A recollescent stone, an ornament that gives five armor and five resistance. Attached to a fine chain is a hunk of polished meteoric metal, fashioned into the shape of an eye. While cool to the touch, it has the bright glow of cooling metal that does not seem to dissipate. You can sense a barely contained surging power behind the glow, a promise of power to those who can control it. You gain this item at great cost by plucking it from a malevolent scaled statue. Okay, we'll leave it alone. An ornament. Let's give that to us. Mm. Hmm. Ring is an ornament. Where is our other ornament? Is it down here? No. We have the sapient blade. Goodness. There's no order in this. Of 
Quandred rings. That was it. Hey, ring, you get the conduit rings. We convert can convert that to uh, some damage type, the range damage. So, show them what we've learned. So nice. That wasn't too bad, eh? Let's see what we find in the next one. An explorer by heart. So we explore and maybe prepare before we meet our sire. All right. Ooh, what is that? That looks crazy. There's Matkina here and Tash. Like a jar, mundane, but not generic. This place was not built from your memories, but you know you've seen these before. It would take immense strength to create homes from these slabs of rock. You remember now, these are the homes of Colm Village from the Mia Matkina gave you. But we're in Colm Village now. Killing them, leave my family alone. Talk to her. Damn you to the blackest hells, Pudge. But Kina holds her weapons tightly and screams. As you come close, the shadows around her solidify. Is reliving the horrors of the attack on Colm. For a moment, you are there with her. The first militia lashes out with their weapons, and the villagers transform into their monstrous forms again. Her weapons have no effect. Her dying friends gout blood that washes around her boots. Tash is nearby. His face contorted with rage. Somehow he's involved in this. Scantle's name, Tick. I'm so sorry, I didn't know. The faces in Matkina's nightmare change and twist. You see the first mask. Pudge's face, Melmoth. The Memovira. Countless faces jeering, mocking, spilling their contempt across her. He fights savagely against the faces arrayed against her. Each another stone in a wall of betrayal and mistrust. He's muttering and whimpering as if caught in a living dream. And you can hear her whispers, traitor, murderer of dreams, butcher, my fault, must scatter you, burn you. I'm here, Matkina, you don't need to fight anymore. I'm here, Neng, she says. The shadows leer and twist around her, and a distorted version of Pa's face looms in the air. She raises a flame lance high over her head and strikes swiftly. Matkina knocks it aside, plunging a knife in the shadow's body. Ferocious heat from the lance washes over you, even as the lance vanishes. This illusion is powerful, too powerful to just talk her out of it. In a whisper almost too soft to hear, you hear Matkina say, I don't want to fight anymore. Shake her to snap her out of it. Come on, Matkina. Put your hand on her shoulder to shove her, and she lashes out quick as lightning. You snatch your hand away just in time. Come on, coward, she, she screams. Come and fight. Come and die for what you've done. We'll try that again. Reach out again, barely pulling away in time to avoid her blade. This isn't working. Her illusion is too strong. You sense the knowledge you need to help her is in the labyrinth somewhere. But not here in this fathom. We'll leave her. Maybe Tash. Flickering shapes and ambient shadows that bedevil Tash are almost invisible. As you near, they take form. You see Matkina struggling against the forces of the first militia in Colm, and Tash is lunging at her, snarling as, he, snarling as he tries to undo the changes you wrought in his history. He struggles against the constraints you placed on him, and you inhabited his body. He snarls and spits as you violate his life and choice. He's alive with defiance and humiliation. Scandals, no, no, get off my mind! My body is not, this is not how it's supposed to be. We'll persuade him. This isn't real, Tash. It's just an illusion. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. He shakes his head violently. He can hear your words, but perhaps not your voice. He claps his hands over his ears. I reject this illusion. I reject it. This is my past. This is not real. 
The shadows fade, the voice is dull and dim. He looks up at you, wonder dawning in his eyes. Yes, he murmurs, yes, I am free. He stands straight and the fabric of his body begins to fray. He wraps his arms around himself, becoming insubstantial. I am free, he whispers again. Then he vanishes altogether. Such strange things we know here in Colm village. We might go to another one, but and then go back to Matkina, but we'll explore more of this in the next episode. Thank you for watching and happy gaming to you. This is Immanuel Kahn signing out. See you soon, my friends.